Welcome to the Blue Ridge Institute for Theological Education's Old Testament 512, Poetic Books of the Old Testament. My name is Kyle Ferguson, and I will be the professor of record for this class. So let's go ahead and get started. What exactly do we mean when we say poetic books or books of poetry? On the one hand, we mean Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and I'm including in this class, Lamentations, although it's separated from the other five books by Isaiah and Jeremiah, and often is studied with the prophets. But what do we mean when we say these are poetic books? For one thing, keep in mind that we are referring to these books by their form, a poetic form. The other possible form in literature we describe with the word prose, so that we say a passage is either prose or poetic. Much of the historical books are written in prose, a narrative description that reads in many places like a novel. But think about how we describe all the other sections of scripture. We have the law, the books of Moses, we have history, we have prophets. All of those descriptions are based upon their content. Poetic, though, is a description not of content, but of form. To some degree, we could try to describe the poetic books by their content, which people often do by calling the books wisdom literature, but this doesn't quite work since Psalms is not technically wisdom literature. Only certain Psalms fall into that category. And Lamentations is not wisdom literature. It is, and I know this is going to be shocking, a lament. So what makes these six books, Job through Lamentations, most similar is their form, their poetic form. But does this mean that other books of the Old Testament are not poetic? That all other parts of the Old Testament are prose? Think about what you know of the Old Testament. There are poetic sections of the Old Testament in the Song of the Sea, which is Exodus 15, the Song of Hannah, 1 Samuel chapter 2, David's Psalms, of course, which can be found within the historical books, such as 1 Chronicles 16, and even more so, much within those sections of books that we call prophets are actually poetic. Jeremiah is full of songs, songs of lament, for instance. Jonah 2 is a song of thanksgiving. Amos is very poetic. Some books, like Haggai, are described as neither poetic nor prose, but as poetic prose, which is cheating, I know, but that book really is a little of both, which gives scholars of Haggai something to debate. There's a fantastic article I've put on Canvas, if you're interested, Were the Prophets Poets? And I highly recommend that you take the time to read it, or you can check out Chapter 6, Prophecy and Poetry, in the text by Robert Alter, The Art of Biblical Poetry. There's even a fantastic book edited by James Kugel called Prophecy and Poetry. So when we say poetic books, we're not saying that other sections of the Old Testament are not poetic or suggesting they are entirely prose, but that the best way to group the six books we're looking at in this class is as books of poetry. One of the benefits then that I hope you'll gain from this class is that you will learn to study all the poetry of the Old Testament, no matter what section or what book that poetry is found in. So what exactly do we mean when we say that a passage has poetic form? What is poetic form? I've already said that poetry is not prose, but poetry can still tell a story. Just look at Psalm 136, for instance, which walks from creation through the Exodus. In fact, Robert Alter suggests that narrative, or perhaps narrativity, the telling of a story, is often part of Hebrew poetry. So what sets poetry apart from prose? Is it that these books look like poems in our Bibles? Actually, the poetic structure that you see in your English Bible is a decision by the printer and editor of that Bible. Manuscript, the Leningrad Codex, B19A, is actually blocked text. It doesn't look like a poem at all. Actually, it looks like prose, a block, line after line. Even the poetic structure that you see in the Hebrew text that we study from, BHS, or the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, is put in that poem-like structure by the editor of that particular book. The oldest complete manuscript that we have is actually the Aleppo Codex, which is older than the Leningrad Codex. Just it's incomplete, but it too is in block text, even in the poetic books. What it looks like is not a way to pick out poetry. Just because it's written in block doesn't mean it's prose, and just because it's written in stanzas doesn't mean it's poetry. So how do we recognize poetry? The answer is quite simple, and it's probably going to annoy you. Poetry, whether a passage, a book, or a section of books, is a text that is dominated by poetic elements. Now you might be thinking, well, of course, I can't believe I paid $100 for this. Of course poetry contains poetic elements. But that's the point where we need to be careful. 
poetry does not simply contain poetic elements. Poetry is dominated by poetic elements. Let me give you an example in English. Is this a poem? Written by Arthur Giederman, Gailey the Troubadour. In Spark Hill buried lies that man of mark who brought the obelisk to Central Park. Redoubtable Commander H. H. Gorringe, whose name supplies the long-sought rhyme for orange. Of course, we recognize this as a poem. We recognize the meter. We recognize the rhyme. This is a poem. What about this passage from Paula LaRoque from the Book of Writing? Technology may have freed us from conventional war, which in the past consumed the whole nation and annihilated an entire generation. We would probably say that this is prose, but there is a metered flow to the phrasing, and there's rhyming, nation, generation. But that first passage on the obelisk was clearly a poem, and the second is clearly not. Even though both have consistent meter, even though both have rhyme, the difference is not in the presence of poetic elements, but the dominance. In fact, you probably didn't even notice the elements in the second passage, but they are impossible to miss in the first passage. The elements dominate that poem. The same is true of Hebrew poetry. Poetic elements dominate Hebrew poetry. We're going to talk about poetic elements in just a moment, but that's not to suggest that these elements cannot be found elsewhere in the Old Testament. Just as meter and rhyme in my second English example were there, just not obvious. Sometimes the writer of a text outside of poetic books will make parallel statements, still use repeated words as if they were a chorus or a refrain, still use metaphor, but these passages are not poetry. Take Genesis 1, for instance. There is a repeated refrain. There was morning and evening, the blank day. There is the and God said, as well as it was good. But it is still debated if Genesis 1 is poetry, although there are poetic elements to it repetition of a theme, etc. You might be able to say that Genesis 1 is not straight prose, but you can't really say that it's straight poetry either, because the poetic elements do not dominate the chapter. It's not really until someone asks, is Genesis 1 a poem, that we even think about it. But Psalm 23, we all know Psalm 23 is poetic. There's no one who would challenge that. So simply put, a poetic passage is one that is dominated, that's the key word, dominated by poetic forms. You cannot overlook a poetic passage. I would suggest to some degree, it's even why we don't think much of the prophetic books as poetic, because what dominates them is that they're prophetic, not necessarily poetic. But even then, we usually know when a prophet is being poetic because it's so hard to miss. Jeremiah 9.1, O oh, that my head were waters, and my eye a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. That's not prose. Clearly, that's poetry. It is generally understood that Hebrew poetry has three main poetic forms. The first is that generally Hebrew poetry is compact. I don't necessarily mean brief. I mean that a great deal of information has been summed up into a small space. Rather than saying the sun is yellow and orange and hot, we might say that the sun is a ball of fire. In fact, we might not even say that the sun is a ball of fire. We might simply call the sun a ball of fire. That paints a picture in our minds, temperature, color, shape, all in just three words, ball of fire. Just think of all the information that is summed up in that poem that I read earlier. In Spark Hill Buried lies that man of mark who brought the obelisk to Central Park, redoubtable commander H. H. Gorringe, whose name supplies the long-sought rhyme for orange. There is no mention of New York, but we know that's probably where the poem is set since it speaks of Central Park. The poem is about a military man named Gorringe, probably Navy, since he was a commander, which is one rank below captain in the Navy system. Actually, I did a little research, and I found out that he was, in fact, a lieutenant commander and a U.S. naval engineer. And he was redoubtable, worthy of respect. He was formidable. He was a worthy opponent or adversary, all-inspiring, fearsome. A lot is summed up in that word, redoubtable. And he's dead and buried, and apparently brought an obelisk, in fact, the obelisk, to Central Park, Apparently, we're supposed to know what obelisk is being spoken of. It's even capitalized in the original poem. This refers, the obelisk, to Cleopatra's Needle in Central Park, built in 1500 BC in Heliopolis in Egypt by Tutmos III. Why it's called Cleopatra's Needle is unknown. She lived a thousand years after the obelisk was built. 
The obelisk itself weighs 244 tons and is 71 feet tall and was brought by Gorringe to the park in 1881. But all that information is assumed in just three lines, 19 words, referenced as the obelisk. That's compact. The same is true in Hebrew poetry as well. There is streamlining in terms of the grammar. The direct object marker, Aleph Tav, is used less, as is Asher, the relative pronoun which means who that which, Aleph Shin Resh. This often makes the text seem more terse, simply because there are less words per verse. In addition, there's often what we call parataxis. This means there's no way to formally submit one line to the next. Words that might be missing are and, but, for, and other connective words. Psalm 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Not the Lord is my shepherd, so I shall not want, or therefore I shall not want. Not even and I shall not want. Just two lines with no connection directly. They obviously go together, but that word, that connecting word is missing. There are even many places where we may even have to add in the subject or object because they're assumed or inferred in poetry rather than explicit as in prose. This is called ellipsis, dropping the unnecessary words. Poetry is not shorter, please hear me in that, not just shorter, brevity is not the point, it's compact. There is simply more information packed into less space, more feeling, more emotion, not just facts, this isn't dragnet, but more thought in less words. Compact is really the best word for it, although some scholars like Adele Berlin also use the word terse. There's so much depth in a single phrase. Like Psalm 23, he restores my soul. Four words, just two words in Hebrew, but so much deep theology as we're pictured as sheep, a cast sheep, one that is flipped over on its back. If it's not put on its feet, it will die. And so the shepherd restores the sheep, saves its soul, and puts it back on its feet. Of course, we could say, instead of, he restores my soul, we could say with 1 Kings 1, verse 29, the Lord has redeemed my soul out of every adversity. That's not very descriptive. The adjective every is about as descriptive as it gets in that verse. But again, the issue is not the number of words, seven in this verse in Kings, but how much punch is in those words? Not as much as restores my soul. Another example, the Song of Deborah in Judges 5 is quite long, 31 verses compared to 24 verses in the prose section. The song is not brief at all, but the depth of description of J.L. killing Sisera, so much information in one poem, so much vivid sorrow and triumph, the feeling of Sisera's mother even. Compact, but not brief, not short. She killed him, he's brief but that doesn't tell much beyond the facts. The song that follows the prose, though, is compact but so full of emotion and story. That's poetic. Even Psalm 119, longest psalm in the book, 176 verses, and yet in those verses, the psalmist leaves almost no aspect of the word of God uncovered. He talks about it all. To do the same in prose would probably take chapters, maybe books, not just one chapter. So our first form, compact, a lot in a little space. A second major poetic form is metaphor. If you're like me, this is where you fell asleep in poetry class. But metaphor is one of the major descriptions of poetry in any language, especially within Hebrew poetry, painting a picture with words. This is one of the ways that poetry is able to be so compact, putting so much thought into depth into a small phrase. A metaphor technically connects two items, two words, two objects of knowledge without using like or as which would technically be called a simile. You can always remember the difference between a simile, because it has an L in it, and so it uses like. Metaphor doesn't have an L, so it does not use the word like. Metaphor compares two items or fields of knowledge so that we will bring everything we know of the one field of knowledge into the other without it having to be said. So X is Y. The Lord is the one who protects me, takes care of me, feeds me, watches over me, defends me. The Lord is my shepherd. We know who a shepherd is, even if you've never hung out on a farm. So we know that a shepherd is one who protects me, takes care of me, feeds me, watches over me, and defends me if I'm a sheep. What we understand, that picture that is formed in our minds through words, is accomplished through a metaphor. 
Metaphors work by connecting the world, the domain of A, with the world or the domain of B. This isn't about words, it's about concepts. We take what we know of the concrete world of A, what we know about shepherds and sheep, for instance, and we project that onto B, or in technical jargon, we map domain A onto domain B. A being the source domain, where we get the idea from, and B being the target domain, in this case, the Lord. But it's important to understand that it's not just about the words, but concepts. For instance, one scholar really likes the metaphor that anger is like a hot liquid kept under pressure in a container. But we never really use those words. We never say, oh, I'm feeling like hot liquid under pressure in a container. That would be a metaphor or a simile, more technically, but a really bad one. We usually say, I'm about to blow my top, or I've got steam coming out of my ears, or I'm about to burst. Those are all metaphors for anger, but we draw not from the words, but from our understanding of hot liquids kept under pressure in a container. I can feel my blood boiling. The domain, the world of hot liquids, is projected onto the domain, onto the world of anger. That's the case, too, in Psalm 23. The rest of Psalm 23 draws from the world of shepherding, even the end of the psalm, where the Lord sets a table before me. Shepherds protected their sheep, but according to Bernard Anderson, shepherds were also very hospitable to travelers. The domain, the field, the ideas come from shepherds and what we know about shepherds, and we project that, map that onto the Lord. According to the book Metaphor by Hungarian scholar Kovesis, we typically use metaphors to take something that we understand well, or in his terminology is more concrete, and use it to describe the more abstract. We understand shepherds far more than the infinite nature of Almighty God. But this also means that for a metaphor to be most effective, you generally have to understand the concrete domain first. I could tell you that having seven kids is a lot like playing the sport high alive. Unfortunately, you have to know something about high alive for that metaphor to work, even if it's true. Having seven kids is a lot like having heavy balls flying at your head. But beyond that, the metaphor fails if you have no idea about that sport. Supposedly, Bible translators in some countries had trouble translating Isaiah's metaphor of God washing our sins white as snow. What is snow? Some of the people apparently asked. They'd never seen it. The metaphor didn't work. Legend has it the Bible translators went with white as the meat of a coconut. You have to understand domain A to understand what the metaphor is trying to tell us about domain B. There is also the issue of figuring out what part of domain A is in question. For instance, sheep stink. Is that what the psalmist has in mind in Psalm 23? And because sheep stink, the shepherd stinks. Does God stink? Is that the point of Psalm 23? This is where context comes into play. Not every part of domain A will be mapped onto domain B. For instance, remember that metaphor about anger being like keeping hot liquids under pressure? In some cases, like in the case of liquid propane, keeping things under pressure is actually good, because if we didn't keep propane under pressure, it would boil and evaporate. And if it evaporated, we wouldn't have any propane to cook our hamburgers. So does that mean that it's good to keep anger bottled up inside you like it is to keep propane bottled up? Well, not necessarily. Holding your anger can have really bad health effects. There are limits, then, to metaphor. But those limits are found in context. The psalmist, from what we know of the rest of Scripture, the scriptural context, would never say that God stinks. And yet Jesus uses sheep and shepherd again in John 10 to speak of himself as the good shepherd because he knows that in his context, people were familiar with shepherds and with Psalm 23. There are several different types of context for biblical metaphors. For one, there is the textual context of Scripture. We can say in Psalm 23 that Jesus is the shepherd, but when we speak of sacrifices for salvation, we also say that Jesus is the sheep. The same is true of John 2.19, where Jesus is the temple. Three days later, I will raise up this temple. But then we read in Ephesians 2 that we, the body of believers, are the temple of God's Spirit. Or in 1 Corinthians 6, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's three uses of a single metaphor. God's presence on earth in a temple. That's the metaphor, so we can say that Jesus is the temple because he is God dwelling, or we can say that we are the temple, both as individuals because the Spirit of God dwells in us, but also as the church because the Spirit of God dwells among us. This is the importance of textual context. Textual context defines the metaphors, or else we can often really go off the rails 
and might be tempted to think that God stinks. And not just textual context, there's also cultural context. Psalm 1, what is chaff? The wicked are like chaff. Why is chaff a good metaphor for the wicked? It's not just about looking the word up in a lexicon. It's about finding out what it is about chaff that fits the wicked. Or streams of water that the righteous are planted next to in Psalm 1, literally transplanted next to. There are a few streams in Israel, but more recent research suggests these streams in Psalm 1 are actually irrigation canals, which makes sense in the Middle East. But we as Americans living on the other side of the globe may not know that, even if we look up streams in a dictionary or a lexicon, we will have to actually research the cultural context of the text in question. Same with metaphors that are specific to a given time or era or a specific realm or area. What was shepherding like in the ancient Near East? What was the purpose of a shepherd's staff? What is a shepherd's rod? How is that different than a staff? Why are they a comfort to the sheep? Why do streams of water that sheep drink from have to be still? That's all fairly important for the understanding of the extended metaphor of Psalm 23, which means in order to figure these metaphors out completely and to figure out what they do not mean, we have to research. Of course, there are tons of books and dictionaries and encyclopedias on the cultures of the Bible today. In fact, there are even books and dictionaries and encyclopedias on the cultural metaphors and idioms used by biblical cultures, because many of these metaphors cut across many different nationalities. In addition, we continue to learn more and more through archaeology. Thus, these books and articles are a great source for researching various idioms and metaphors to make sure we understand what a metaphor means, even more importantly, what the metaphor doesn't mean. This is where a lot of modern biblical interpretation gets itself in trouble, of trying to take advantage of a metaphor without allowing the limitations of the textual, cultural, and historical context to guide our understanding of the metaphor. We must understand the context of domain A for domain B to make sense. Know the context, not just the words. Take, for instance, Psalm 131.2. I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Is God a woman, then? No, God is often described as a mother. The image is here of one of comfort, a weaned child finding shelter with its mother. Except that a weaned child is not as dependent upon its mother as a child who is not yet weaned. Is this psalm to suggest that we don't need God, that we're somehow weaned off of him? No, of course not. That's why context is important. Otherwise, we get crazy ideas like God is a woman or we're independent of him. Suffice to say, there are limits to metaphors that must be kept in mind, and yet we can conclude that there is some similarity between domain A and domain B or the metaphor would be useless. Going to a football game is like dinosaurs? That doesn't make sense. Presbyterians are like aardvarks? That doesn't make sense either. There must be some connection, or perhaps the author must make the connection, between domain A and domain B. Although keep in mind there is room for creativity, of making unknown previous connections. In fact, this may be one of the major realms of creativity. Consider Peter who takes the we are the temple metaphor a bit further in 1 Peter 2 and says we're the stones that build the temple. This is where the creativity of the author comes in, not falling into set patterns, but using, reusing, and adapting already existent metaphors for a new purpose. One last word on metaphor. There is a special type of metaphor called metonymy. This is using a part for the whole. We often read in the biblical poetry about Mount Zion, which is being used to represent all of Jerusalem. Psalm 2, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Zion is the metonymy. The holy hill is the metonymy. Metonymy is a little different than most metaphor in that metaphor is about concepts from domain A being used to describe domain B. Metonymy, on the other hand, is not concepts, but using words linguistic elements rather than conceptual elements from within domain to speak of the whole domain. Mount Zion is a part of Israel, but it is used to speak of all of Israel or Jerusalem. Or in my slide here, the last word on metaphor. But it's not the last word. I'm using a lot of words. There will be a last word, and so we speak of all of my words as the last words on metaphor. This type of metonymy helps with the compact nature of poetry because it sums up a lot in one word, the whole into one part. Instead of mapping A onto B with a metaphor, all of A is mapped onto subpart A with a metonymy. In Psalm 2, all of the rule, all the authority, all of the Messiah's power is focused upon God's holy hill, upon Zion, all represented by part. So, two parts of poetry. So far we've covered compactness, 
and metaphor. So what element of poetry have we not talked about yet? What are the two poetic forms that are most well known in English poetry? Well, rhyme and meter. Yes, meter. Perhaps you remember the term iambic pentameter, literally five feet in English class, the preferred meter for Shakespeare in English sonnets. Hebrew poetry, though, doesn't have meter. Now, there are people who would disagree with that statement. Frank Cross, for instance. Some have suggested that Hebrew tries to have some sort of meter, like using the same number of words or syllables in each line of a verse. Many have even suggested that the meter of lament is three words or syllables in the first part of the line and two words or syllables in the second part of the verse or line. Anderson, in the text Out of the Depths, calls this the meter of lament. And even though that pattern is common, meter is still not the best term. Perhaps structure of lament might be better. Some scholars call it rhythm, but it's not meter like English has meter. Part of the reason for this is that we have no idea what the poems, especially the Psalms, sounded like sung. Now, Psalms does have different accents than the rest of the Old Testament Hebrew, but so does Job and Proverbs. And I don't know of anybody who's suggesting that Job should be sung the same way that Psalms should. Now, it's certainly possible, even probable, that at one point the Psalms were sung, but no one today knows what they sounded like which means we can't recreate what some might call meter. Hebrew even occasionally rhymes, but not regularly enough to make it rhythm. Sometimes the rhythm repeats or is balanced, two syllables in one line, two syllables in the next, two in the next, and so on. And yet at the same time, that's more a matter of grammatical parallelism rather than rhythm or meter. Suffice to say, meter and rhythm are simply not hallmarks of Hebrew poems like they are in English. This all leads up to what is the third poetic form, but I've saved the most important to last. This is the number one hallmark, the biggest, most identifiable characteristic of Hebrew poetry, really of Semitic poetry in general, parallelism. Parallelism is really what sets apart poetry as poetry in the Hebrew Bible. Now hear me carefully, parallelism is a poetic element, and from time to time it will exist in prose. So just because you see parallelism doesn't mean you have a poetic passage. But if you have poetry, you will see, I dare say almost always see in the Bible, parallelism. When we say parallelism, we simply mean that the two lines of a given couplet or a two-line pair are parallel. They go together. In some cases, it may be one line, like the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. That's parallel, but it's only one line in Hebrew. Parallel parts are not necessarily full lines of a verse. I'm going to explain parallelism in terms of two lines, but keep in mind that two, while the majority is certainly not the only option, it is the most common option. Roman Jacobson calls the parallel notion between lines equivalence. Others call it balance. Kugel sums it up best that he says when a verse is parallel, we can't help but notice that the couplet is parallel. He says two statements are made as if they were connected. Hence my example, roses are red, violets are blue. We're talking about flowers, but we have different colors, but we know that they're parallel. Adele Berlin, whose book, The Dynamics of Biblical Parallelism, is considered a classic on the topic, says, the reader cannot avoid considering that the two lines have a relationship. Consider this example of Job 7.3, a verse I chose completely at random. So I am allotted months of emptiness, and nights of misery are apportioned to me. Hear the repetition? Allotted, apportioned, months of emptiness, nights of misery. Keep in mind, though, as we'll see in just a moment, that like with metaphor, we're not always talking about mere words, but also about concepts and ideas. Nights and months aren't synonyms, but they are clearly parallel as periods of time. Similar words may be parallel in the two lines, but also the notions, the arguments, the topics of these lines may be parallel with one another. Of course, I need to give a little caveat here because we say that lines are parallel in content, in concept. We mean they're parallel in the Hebrew mind, in the Hebrew concept, not necessarily in the American mind. For instance, if I were to say in line one, three things, what would you expect in line two? Well, three things. That makes sense to us. As my father used to say, it's six one way and half a dozen the other. But that's not how the Hebrew mind works. For Hebrews, 
what's parallel to 3 is 4. Thus, Proverbs 30, verse 18 says, There are three things which are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. That's Hebrew poetry. It's parallel in the Hebrew mind, not the American mind. Fortunately, there aren't too many instances where the Hebrew mind and the American mind differ on such a level. We generally notice parallelism when we see it in the poetic books of the Bible. But this kind of verse that we see here in Proverbs chapter 30 also helps us understand the purpose of parallelism. That term parallelism was coined by the theologian Robert Loth in 1778. And for centuries, Loth's definition of parallelism was the standard. However, in 1981, a scholar by the name of James Kugel wrote a book entitled The Idea of Biblical Poetry, Parallelism and Its History. His main point of that book is that there are two lines, two parallel lines, lines A and B, but that line B is not a mere repetition of line A just for the sake of repeating itself. No, Kugel points out that the poet included line B to further explain, to further expand, further unpack line A. Kugel says it is line A, and what's more, line B. Robert Alter, in The Art of Biblical Poetry, calls this intensification. Because of this, Kugel suggests it's not simply line A and line B. Instead, he suggests that really it is line A and line A+. plus. That is, line B is really line A, but taken a step further, showing us further detail, another insight, more information, a clarification really of line A. This explains why the parallel of three things in Proverbs 30, 18 is four things, not a repetition of three things, A and what's more, B. Adele Berlin gives this example of intensification or expansion in Judges 4.19. Sisera asks Jael for water. However, the text says she gaze in milk. No big deal, we think. It's still liquid. But on the other hand, the Song of Deborah in Judges 5.25 says water he asked for, milk she gave. There's a balance. Two liquids, two verbs. Water is asked for, milk is given. But the contrast is highlighted and intensified. It cannot be mixed or skipped over as it may be in prose. J.L. didn't give Sisera what he asked for. So already at the beginning of the story, if we're listening to the poetry, we'll realize that J.L. has a plan of her own. If Sisera had only read the poetry instead of the prose, he might have picked up on the fact that she had something up. She had an alternative plan, and he might have saved his life. The poetry intensifies the difference. Line A, water. But what's more, line B, milk not water. Alas, Sisera didn't read the poem, and he ended up dead. But parallelism does not exist in Hebrew poetry simply for the purpose of art, although you'll find many scholars who will say that. Yes, parallelism is certainly an art, but the real goal of this poetic form is to get the message, to get one's point across to the reader. Otherwise, the poem as a whole has failed. One scholar even says that the very definition of poetic is a text which focuses upon the message for its own sake. Not about what you should do with the message, how you should respond to the message, or how you should feel about the message. What poetry cares about is that you get the message. So parallelism, regardless of how it's formed, is not for art's sake, as artful as it may be, but to narrow and specify the point that is being made. Consider then Psalm 1. As we read Psalm 1, we would assume that if verse 1 of Psalm 1 is true, that the blessed man in question does not do these things, walking, standing, sitting, we would assume from that description that the man probably does good instead. But the psalmist is not content with that. Lest we miss his point, he adds verse 2. He makes the contrast stand out in his mind so that we will fully grasp his point. The psalmist further explains the behavior of a blessed person, further unpacks the description of this man. Thus, verse 2 is parallel to verse 1 with the goal of explaining even more line 1. The verses are equivalent, balanced. The man does not do this. The man does this. This is Hebrew poetry, comparing and contrasting, highlighting similarities and differences so that we more greatly understand the message of what the psalmist is saying. The message is intensified in order to get our attention. Psalm 1 verse 2 is also an example of another contribution to parallelism. Parallelism does not simply take place on the level of verses, but in sentences, paragraphs, and more. 
it's not simply line B of verse 1 in Psalm 1 that's parallel to line A. Actually, all of verse 2 is parallel to verse 1. And there are all sorts of examples in Scripture of such types of parallelism. Chiasm is a form of parallelism. Inclusio, or bookends, where the same idea opens and closes a passage, like the first verse of Psalm 1, blessed is the man who, and the end of Psalm 2, blessed is the man who. That's another form of parallelism. We most often talk about parallelism on the verse level, true, but we need to be aware that the limits of the verse are not a limit to parallelism. We find parallelism in larger sections as well. Verse A and what's more, verse B. Section A and what's more, section B. One other purpose of parallelism needs to be mentioned, what Adele Berlin calls ambiguity. Berlin takes this title ambiguity from a scholar by the name of Waugh, W-A-U-G-H, who says that parallelism may intensify line A with line B, to use Alter's term, or poetry may use ambiguity to give a new, different meaning to the first line. Alter calls this specification. It is these differences, these ambiguities, that really make poetry work and function. When the poet includes a parallel line, he or she is unpacking the first line. But part of this unpacking is explaining what the author means or does not mean. The second line may be quite similar to line one, or line two may actually be quite different from line one, meant to give line one a slightly nuanced meaning. Not A and what's more B, but A, and what I mean by A, or perhaps even because I mean A, there's B. Take, for example, Proverbs 21.9. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop. What do we expect to come next? I can think of a lot of ways to complete that sentence. It's better to live in a corner of the housetop than to die by firing squad. It's better to live in a corner of the housetop than to eat worms for dinner. It's better to live in a corner of the housetop than... That's an ambiguous statement. What's better? And then what does the poet say? Then in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. We have a similarity here. Better to live on the roof than in the house. We see the parallelism. But with a quarrelsome wife? That comes out of left field. That's a bizarre comparison. But it makes sense. But this second idea is still parallel because she is in the house while we're on the roof. But the second idea of a quarrelsome wife gives the verse a whole new meaning that we expected. This is the advantage of similarity and dissimilarity, or as Berlin calls it, disambiguation and ambiguity, of clarifying the previous statement or of taking the previous statement in a whole new direction, giving the first line a different meaning. This is the advantage of narrowing, of specification. This is the art of parallelism. It can be line A, and what's more B, or it can be line A, but what I really mean is B. The verse moves beyond line A either to intensify line A, so what's more, line B, or to specify line A, moving the thought forward to line B. The emphasis may then be on the second thought, or third thought. It's better to live on a corner of a roof than in the house with a quarrelsome wife. But this is what is even more complicated in Hebrew poetry that most often both purposes are true in a given verse. A verse may actually be intensifying and specifying. For instance, think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The second line is parallel to the first line, but the second line is certainly not redundant. The poem, if he was being redundant, might have been, the Lord is my shepherd, God Almighty is my provider. That would be simple parallelism. The Lord is parallel to God Almighty, shepherd is parallel to provider. But the author, David, according to verse 1, had a different kind of parallel line in mind. I shall not want. The second line completes the thought of the first, but with a slight change of focus. The focus is not upon the Lord as shepherd in the second line, but upon the poet not being in want. He narrows his focus in line 2. We might even understand the word therefore inserted here parataxically. Line 1 is the underlying reason for line 2, or line 2 is the result of line 1. And yet, to some degree, this does intensify the content of line 1. Because of line A, line B, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore, what's more, because of that, I shall not want. 
The second line here also takes advantage of the ambiguity of line 1 and intensifies line 1. Because the content of line 1 is true, the content of line 2 is true, but the slight change in focus serves to highlight a particular aspect of the Lord's being a shepherd, namely, I am the sheep. Now the poet could have said, the Lord is my shepherd, I am his sheep. That would also be parallelism. But what the poet wants to highlight, as is explained in the next several lines, is that the Lord provides and protects for me, his sheep. Because of A, then B, all of this, that I am a sheep, and that God protects and provides, and that this will be the focus of the next few lines, is completely summed up in just two words in Hebrew, I will not want. Parallelism is not just a repetition of the content of line one in a different way. Instead, that second thought clarifies, specifies, intensifies the words of line one. So in this verse, we see both intensification and specification. Berlin puts it this way, redundancy and ambiguity are locked in an eternal struggle. Intensification, specification. It's not always either or, but oftentimes both. But what actually causes parallelism? Roman Jacobson says, pervasive parallelism inevitably activates all the levels of language. Thus, Adele Berlin gives four different ways that parallelism is caused. Parallelism of words, the parallelism of grammar and parts of speech, parallelism of ideas, and the parallelism of sounds. C. David Lamb, in his book, God Speaks Once, Yea, Twice, suggests eight different connectors. You could give list after list after list of all the different ways in which parallelism is actually caused. We could talk about the words and the lexical structure. We could talk about the grammatical structure. We could talk about the different ways in which the ideas are carried forward in each part of the line. We could talk about immediate, synonymous parallelism, alternating parallelism, constructive parallelism, chiasm, the number parallelism, staircase, etc., etc., etc. We could go on ad nauseum talking about all the different types of parallelism. But it could all be summarized in that very statement by Jacobson. Pervasive parallelism inevitably activates all the levels of language. But really, parallelism at the end of the day doesn't have rules. It leaves room for creativity. Sometimes creativity involves not just working within the rules, sometimes it involves deliberately breaking the rules or overlapping rules. The poet knows that we expect something to come next and then deliberately gives us something different. The Lord asks through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 13, 23, does a leopard change its spots? Well, no, of course not. So what do we expect next? Something else that doesn't change. Jeremiah 13, 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Well, again, no. Then also, you can do good who are accustomed to do evil. Does that second line make any sense in light of the first one? You can do good? Why is God telling the people to do good when he just said leopards don't change spots? Verse 22 speaks of the iniquity of the people's hearts. God is telling the Israelites that they can't do good. Their hearts are wicked. But God doesn't say that, which is what we would have expected. Instead, God is sarcastic with them. The leopard can't change, so basically, you try and change. You can't, because just like the leopard, you cannot change your heart. But God says this in an ambiguous way with a metaphor, in a creative way to make the point more poignant. Leopards can't change, so you who are evil can't do good. This is the creativity of the poet. He or she knows the rules and then stretches them, breaks them. Creativity is the poet choosing what best keeps us as readers on our toes to most clearly get the message across. As one scholar puts it, if poetry were predictable or reducible to a system, it wouldn't be poetry. That's a point well taken. So here we've covered three poetic forms, metaphors, compact nature of poetry, and parallelism. Now we're ready to go on to our next topic. What is wisdom?